Yeah, uh, thank you, Olaf, for the uh, introduction, and thanks to the organizers for inviting me to this conference. So I'm very happy to talk about, uh, by the way, is the microphone on? Is this? Yeah, is this? Okay, okay. That, that's the kind of a weird thing. Yeah. Anyway, so I'm very uh, happy to talk about my joint work with um, Blake Temple from UC Davis, so about uh, optimal regularity. Um, so let me first give you um, uh, one slight introduction to, to the whole talk, a, a summary of everything, and then I go into the details. Okay, so um, first of all, our motivation work on optimal regularity comes from uh, general relativity, from, from shock wave solutions, shock wave solutions of the einstein euler equation general relativity. So uh, shock waves are um, discontinuous solutions uh, in fluid dynamics, so of the Euler equations in fluid dynamics, so you have many surfaces of discontinuities. And in relativity, these shock waves uh, appear when you when you consider perfect fluid source of the Einstein equation. So perfect fluid tends on the right hand side. Okay, and in that setting, you can have shock wave solutions. And now the existence theory of these um, shock wave solutions is such that that it produces these uh, Lipschitz uh, Lipschitz continuous metric tensors. Okay, you have only Lipschitz metric tensors, and that's uh, quite a singular situation. Okay, not not terrible. Terribly singular, not black hole type of singular. I mean, you can still live with that, and you can have causal structures and so on. But uh, you lose some uh, desirable structures. So first of all, the Einstein equation can only hold in weak sense. That's one issue. Uh, you lose uh, the standard ODE theory for geodesic equations of Nucleano theorem. You, you don't have that anymore, but then there are other ways to make sense of that. Uh, and it's not clear whether you have uh, locally um, inertial frames. Okay, and so if you take some Newtonian limits, so that's also a uh, uh, something you would like to do, you would like to have classical mechanics as a limiting case so that it's not clear whether it works out. So that's that's the singular nature of, of the situation. Okay, and so we're wondering, uh, can you actually <coughs> remove these singularities in the metric tensor in the sense, can you improve the regularity of the metric tensor by one derivative? Okay, roughly one derivative, that would be enough to recover all these structures in a standard classical way, so then you have a non-singular um, geometry. Okay, and there's actually some hope that this works out because the curvature tensor at these shockwave solutions is, is bounded. It's nice and bounded, and it's very discontinuous. You have many discontinuities sitting in potentially uh, surfaces, intersecting surfaces of discontinuity, but it's, it's still bounded, okay? And so um, you might be able to improve the metric regularity by one derivative to two derivatives above the curvature tensor. Okay, and that's, that's actually what happens pretty much, I mean, an analogy, at the uh, apparent singularity at the Schwarzschild uh, uh, horizon, okay, in the in the classical um, Schwarzschild solution, okay. So in, in that, with that in mind, uh, maybe maybe one can really uh, resolve this question in the affirmative. And we worked on that for for a couple of years, and then eventually, uh, to make a long story short, uh, it turned out yes, yes, you can always improve the regularity by one derivative to um, well two derivatives above the uh, Riemann curvature tensor, and that's what we call optimal regularity. Okay, so if the metric is two derivatives more regular, I mean, the generic situation would expect to be true anyways, okay? So that is possible. And this is actually, uh, this is a special case of a much more general theorem. And that's actually the main theorem I want to uh, present today. That's our optimal regularity theorem. And that states that for any affine connection, so any connection on the tangent bundle, um, doesn't need to come from a, from a Lorentzian metric, and it could be could come from any semi-random metric. Doesn't need to come from a metric, as long as it's it's a connection on the tangent bundle. Then you can always regularize it by coordinate transformation to, to one derivative above the Riemann curvature, LP Riemann curvature tensor. Okay, so that's always possible. And that is optimum regularity. So the connection connection being one derivative more regular than the Riemann curvature tensor, the generic situation. And then the metric tends has always two derivatives above that. Because the metric is always precisely one derivative above the connection, okay? By the Christoffel formula, right? So that is the main result. Um, and now the proof is based on, on a new system of elliptic PDEs. And that gives you the regularizing corner transformation, the system of PDEs. And it's always elliptic, regardless of metric signature, okay? So you always have an elliptic system you can work with and you get elliptic uh, PDE theory, elliptic estimates, and that gives you this result. And that's why we actually use these spaces tuned to elliptic PDE theory here. Okay, um, 
Well, in this result also, um, you can extend it from connections on tangent bundles to connections on vector bundles, okay? That also works out uh, for, for non-compact um, gauge groups, um, S, S, O, R, S, so on. So you can also um, extend that to very uh, general geometries, this result. Okay, and uh, because of the elliptic theory, you have uh, uniform bounds, okay? And so from the uniform bounds, uh, if you have a sequence of connections, you get a compactness, compactness theory. And that's Uhlenbeck compactness. So that means you get a compactness of a sequence of connections just from uh, a uniform bound on the curvature alone. You don't need a bound on the full connection derivative, just a part of the curvature. Okay, that's Uhlenbeck compactness. All right, so that's, uh, that's the whole talk, essentially. Uh, now, in the rest of the talk, I will just introduce these things here in more detail, okay? So I want to um, actually explain these things, how to get there. Uh, I mean, this is all uh, this is all in the Lorentzian. I mean, this is actually more general. I mean, it's for any affine connections here. But Ulmbeck's classical theorem is in the Riemannian setting on the base manifold, and then you have some varying um, part on the on the vector bundle. That's that's actually the classical theorem. I'll, I'll show that in more detail later on. <laughs> okay, so this is just uh, that was just a preview on the talk. So let's actually begin with the actual talk. Uh, okay, six minutes in, so that's okay. Uh, so let me let, let me just uh, introduce these main results now slowly, and then I will get to the elliptic PDE system and show you how to prove uh, these results. Okay, that's the structure of the talk. So um, first of all, our setting here, it's, I mean, it's very local, very, very um, explicit. So for us, a connection, whenever I talk of a connection, gamma, I always mean the connection coefficients, okay? It's always the collection of coefficient functions. That's all um, I mean here. These could come um, from a metric tensor, from a Lorentz metric, so by the Christoffel formula, but they don't have to. Any, any connection is fine. That's absolutely okay. Um, and we assume this connection is defined on an, on an open and bounded set omega, a subset of Rn. Okay, so we're in this very explicit setting. And then once you have the connection, um, you can introduce Riemann curvature tensor by the Fossil formula, which is standard range, and I guess you, you all know that. And uh, let me just write it in, in this curl, this is curl notation here. Um, okay, um, yeah, so, so this, this is all, this is the whole setting. Um, so this is a local setting, of course, so, um, so this set omega, we interpret that as a coordinate patch, the image of a coordinate system in the manifold, um, but we don't care about what the, what the actual manifold is, okay? So, so we don't care about the bigger manifold, at, we just look at the little picture of the manifold, we don't care about the global structure. And actually, at that stage, so what this collection is here, I mean, it's really just a collection of functions so far. It's just a collection of functions. What really makes this is a, a connection is the way it transforms from one coordinate system to another coordinate system, this connection transformation. It's the only thing that makes this a connection and a geometric object here, okay? And that's, that's all we look at. That's the, the only structure we, we assume, and the only objects we look at, okay? So, uh, yeah, we are local guys. I just want to emphasize this. And the problem we, uh, the problem of optimum regularity is local, it's about these coordinate representations of connections and so on, and the regularity in the coordinate representation, okay? Um, so yeah, so let, let me introduce the, the op uh, optimal versus non-optimal regularity, this whole issue. So first of all, given a, a connection, a differentiable connection, let's compute the Riemann tensor, okay, we know how to do that. We have to differentiate, put it, I use this causal formula and so on. And so in general, uh, a differentiable connection gives you a continuous Riemann tensor, okay? So that's not a big surprise. That's the optimal situation, okay? So the connection can never be more regular than one derivative plus the Riemann tensor. That's the that's, uh, optimal situation. Now, uh, here's another possibility um, that's also uh, possible to get in this box. We can also have a continuous Riemann tensor, so we fix this regularity for the Riemann tensor, but this could come from a continuous connection, okay? So why is that? Why is that possible? Well, that's because when you compute the Riemann tensor, it doesn't involve all derivatives of the connection, it only involves the curl part of the connection. That's this intrinsic uh, exterior derivative of the connection. So some components of the derivatives don't appear. It's actually th the divergence of the connection which doesn't appear. And so the, the divergence is, is free. It doesn't appear in the computation, so if the badness in the regularity sits in the divergence, you would never de detect it here. And that's why this is possible, the scenario here. So you can sit in the, in the red box, okay? And actually, it's very easy to, to get there, to, to show the existence, because you can always make a, make a singular coordinate transformation, you can always transform from the green box, the optimal box, to the red box. If you use a transformation with the Jacobian, that's just 
differentiable, but not more regular. And that is because, because, um, because the connection transformation law looks roughly like this. We add in a derivative of the Jacobian. Okay, you add in a derivative, and that's then just continuous. Okay, for this guy, for this Jacobian, this would just be continuous. So you lower the regularity. It's a connection. But the curvature is a tensor. So the curvature transforms by contraction with the Jacobian, the undifferentiated Jacobian. Okay? So it, you preserve the regularity in the in the curvature. Okay? So it's a built-in property of the Riemann curvature tensor. Uh, that the curvature of the Riemann tensor, sorry, the regularity of the curvature tensor is uh, is maintained, okay? But the regularity of the connection can change, okay? Because of the differences in the in the transformation laws. Okay, so that's a very generic situation, very natural. All right. Now, um, what's this talk about? So it talks about the question: Well, when you're in the red box, can you always transform back to the green box? Okay. And well, okay, I, I know, I know. Well, uh, you can just take the inverse of the transformation, then you get to the green box. Yeah. But 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 yeah, we, we figured that out after a couple of years. So so we talk about the situation when. Uh, when, when you're in the red box, okay, you start in the red box, you have no idea how you got there. How can you go from the red box back to the green box, okay? The only information you have is what's in the red box. You just have some connection and the curvature tensor and the regularity. That's all you know. Can you always go back by corner transformation from the red box to the green box, okay? So that's the question here. That's the question of optimal regularity or the problem of optimal regularity. Okay, uh, let me look at Sorry, sorry, I'm going ahead of myself here. Um, so for shock waves, um, you sit in the in the red box, and that's also what happens for the Schwarzschild um, apparent singularity of the Schwarzschild horizon. You you sit in the red box, um, but continuity is not good enough for shock waves, and so you need lower regularity. So we need to to be in some LP spaces here. Okay, so we uh, place Riemann tensor in LP. Actually, L infinity for shock waves would be fine. So you need a bounded Riemann tensor and discontinuities here. That's fine. Uh, connection in the same space, you just have L2P because of the of the wedge products, the gamma wedge gamma, so to be consistent um, by Holder, Holder's inequality. It's just a technicality, don't worry about that. Essentially the same space. Now optimal regularity means you're one derivative above the Riemann tensors here in the Sobolev space W1P, one derivative in LP. So here's just a reminder, LP means you integrate over the uh, P's component. These guys, these integrals should all be bound, bounded. And again, with gamma, I just mean uh, the components of the connection. So this is all coordinate dependent here, all these norms we use. So this is just in some fixed coordinate system, we look at these spaces and uh, the norms on these spaces, okay? And W1P means uh, connection or connection components and derivatives of the connection components are in LP, okay? All coordinate dependent. Anyway, so now uh, so there are some prior uh, results um, on this. So first of all, uh, the, the very, uh, the most famous one probably is from Kass and the Turk. They also coined the expression optimal regularity here, and that's really this question of Kass and the Turk. And they resolved it in Riemannian geometry. So when you have a Riemannian metric, so when gamma is a Christoffel symbol of the Riemannian metric, then you can always go from the red box back to the green box. Okay, that's a classical result from 81 of Kass and the Turk. Okay, and now in, um, in the Renzian setting, uh, the first extension of that, to my knowledge, so um, I think that's a pioneering work here uh, due to Michael Anderson. He, he essentially used that result on, on Cauchy surfaces, I mean, on, on a foliation, slice on a foliation, then you um, have to pull that along the foliation, and for this you need a couple of restrictive assumptions, okay? And these, these rule out shock waves, these assumptions. So this result doesn't apply to shock waves, but it's quite general. And so um, what applies to shock waves, actually, in Lorentzian geometry? Well, a very classical result, and pretty famous, I would, I mean, if there is a famous paper in mass, I don't know, but maybe that one is one, so in, in mass physics at least, um, Iswell's junction conditions and so on, and he, in, as, a, as one case in this this paper, also addressed uh, these shock waves when um, you have bounded curvature, no delta peak in the curvature, the Lipschitz metrics, and yeah, there the, the answer is also you can regularize um, the metric, you can always go from the red box to the green box, but that's only, it only applies to single shock surfaces. The shock wave solution we're interested in uh, from the existence theory, we do a, a glimpse scheme. They contain many shockwave interactions. I mean, shockwave surfaces, many surfaces that can intersect, and the intersection points can actually accumulate. So you can have very complicated patterns. Huh? That's because I mean, it's like like waves breaking at the beach. They can reflect off of the cliffs on the side. Um, 
And so they can inter interfere, intersect, so you have very complicated patterns in these shockwave uh, interactions. And so uh, this, this doesn't reflect that. So uh, one step towards these interactions uh, it was done in this work, uh, which myself and, and um, Campo, uh, there you also get the positive uh, resolution, but this is highly restricted. It's just spherical shock waves, and you need a bunch of assumptions on these shock interactions to make that work. And you have to keep track of all these assumptions, so it's, it's very uh, tedious. You have to really stand on your ears to, to get a result out of that. And then it's so specialized that you can't really, you can't use that for um, anything in, in practice. You, because these glim scheme sh uh, solutions have not enough information about the shock surface, shock position, and so on. You can't use that. Same with this one. So for these general shock solutions, you really all the only thing you know is what the Riemann curvature is doing. So you only have this very abstract information about the space. That's all, and you have to work with that alone. And that's again very close to Kassan and the Turks result. That's the structure they use. You can't use their method because they go to the morning coordinates. The Ricci tensor turns turns into a Laplace operator. It's good. It's elliptic theory. You, you lift uh, the regularity to the optimal. So that's how it works. Now in, in the Renzian setting. Uh, you have the wave operator that propagates irregularities in the data. So in the second fundamental form, the irregularities would be propagated in the space time. That's why that doesn't work. So you, you can't, at least it's inconclusive, so you can't use this method. Um, and so we had to, to use something else, and that was fortunate because we got something that's, that's more general anyways than general relativity. Okay, so here's our theorem. Um, uh, the answer is yes, you can always go from the red box to the green box, and that works for any affine connection. Uh, well, as long as that P is strictly bigger than n half. N being here the, the, uh, the dimension of the space time. Okay. Um, so in a four dimensional space time, we are at the moment strict, uh, strictly above uh, L2. Okay. So L2 for the curvature, we're strictly above that at the moment. Okay, uh, so that's, um, that's, uh, that's the actual theorem here, so that's a bit more precise. It doesn't really say more than, than in this cartoon version earlier. Uh, so again, here we start with the assumption, we're in the, in the red box, that's our assumption, and then, well, the, the range for P, and then locally, so you have to go to a smaller, smaller coordinate patch, I mean, at e around each point you can find a neighborhood, and then on this small, small enough neighborhood you can produce a corner transformation, such that in the new coordinates, the connection is in W1P. You gain exactly one derivative above the curvature as you, you start, okay? Uh, the, the lower Y and the lower X that always indicates the coordinate system in which you are, in my notation here, okay? So it's not differentiation or anything. So that's the connection components in Y coordinates, connection components in X coordinates. All right, and actually we get, um, we get this result at all levels of Sobolev regularity. So you have a whole cascade of these optimum regularity results. So start with non-optimal regularity WMP, so M derivatives in LP, and so on. Uh, you start with non-optimal regularity there, then you can go through this whole uh, procedure uh, with the elliptic PDE we have, and you gain one derivative for the connection in the new coordinates. Okay, it works at all levels. Sobolev regularity. You could also go to um, to Holder continuous spaces. We haven't done that, um, but it, it also means PDE theory. Is that that's no problem. That um, one just has to work it out. <laughs> In principle, that's possible. Okay, uh, let me come back to the shock waves. Um, I won't say more about shock waves than in this on this slide, but uh, yeah, yeah. I, I actually just want to <laughs> get to, but exactly that's a singular case, and, and that's um, yeah, uh, yeah. So 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 uh, I'll answer it in a minute. Um, so for the shock waves, just just again, uh, here, here just some pictures of shock waves. So these are actually really physical uh, objects. The idealizations of physical events. So they uh, so these explosion fronts, for example, those are shock waves. They they destroy your windows if you're close to some explosion and so on. Uh, here's a supernova a shock wave driven out by su supernova. Uh, Ah, okay, I thought a supernova. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> because that would be bad news. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, very good. When I was looking outside my window this morning, the sun was really bright. Then a minute later, it was really dark. So I, this, I got a little scared for a second. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, pan a shock wave. A shock wave, really. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, it, 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 like a like a step in the discontinuity, in the sorry, a discontinuity. Let's say in the pressure, fluid velocity, and so on. Okay, so yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, and then actually um, with these ocean waves, these are not really not not directly shock waves. It's just an analogy. So because in shock waves are in gas dynamics and you need compression there and so on. Uh, so it's not exactly like an ocean surface wave, uh, but there are analogies like wave breaking when a wave goes to the beach, it breaks due to compression, so the shallowing water. Uh, compression also forms shock waves and gases, okay? And so shock waves form out of smooth data, you can't avoid them. And like waves at a beach, they can intersect and so on, they will intersect after a while. So you have very complicated wave patterns, okay? So that's just an analogy. By the way, that's a beach in Hong Kong, I just want to point that out, but never, never mind, it's there. <laughs> okay, anyways, now for the shock waves, um, our result states you can regularize uh, the connection by one derivative, that's this theorem. That means actually on this here, if you choose p large enough, and for shock waves, you can pick p equal to infinity, and then for p large enough, well, actually, you would like to have um, Lipschitz continuity, but the thing is, um, in the assumption p equal to infinity, so of course, fine, uh, that's, that's okay. p equal to infinity here would imply that these guys are in any LP space, of course, in a bounded domain, that's trivial. But the thing is, um, you can't get w1p with p equal to infinity, because that's a singular case in elliptic theory, that's exactly what you mentioned. You can't get there, but you can get to any any p you want, as large as you want, can approximate p equal to infinity. And in particular, as long as that p is larger than n, you have holder continuity of the connection. And now in the GEDC equation, you have Peano's theorem, you can just solve the GEDC equation as always, so that's standard, that's good. You have the Einstein equation in a strong sense, uh, as uh, holds as in the sense of our p-function, so that's good. And you can also introduce local inertial frames in a in a Hölder sense. It's a slightly modified construction there. We put that in the paper, but that is also just a locally inertial frame. So you can take a Newtonian limit and a pointwise limit. All works out. Um, one one question that's open, and I think that's still interesting, is uh, uniqueness of GDC curves because we don't have Lipschitz continuity. We we actually we worked on very variations of that using GMO space and so on. It, it doesn't work out. I mean, our method we, we always we run in a loop. You, you can't get uh, you can't get um, Lipschitz continuity here with these methods. Yes. Okay, okay, yeah. Oh, yeah, I mean, something like this would be uh, useful. And we actually think that also at the shock waves, you, you get uniqueness because they're a bit more, a bit better than L infinity and so on. But um, I, I, I should ask you about that um, later on. Um, anyway, so uh, another question? Okay. All right, so that's that's it about shockwaves here, so that's all I want to say. Let's get to the compactness business. Um, so we, from the elliptic theory here, we um, we get estimates, okay? So we, again, we start in the red box here. That's a non-optimal regularity. And the assumption that we are in these spaces, let me just write them down in terms of norms. This statement just means the norms are bounded by some constant, they're just finite. It doesn't say anything, it's the same assumption as always. Just put in these norms. Uh, I, write, I write our assumption these norms, and then our theorem, and that's the same optimal regularity theorem I stated earlier, but now I put in the estimate we get. So we see that the connection of optimal regularity in W1P is actually bounded in that norm um, by some constant depending on the original upper bound, okay? So some constant C depending on, on M, okay? If M goes to zero, then that constant goes also to zero. And also the, the Jacobian that brings us here to the new coordinate system is also bounded, okay? So we control the Jacobian. Um, now these, all these norms, we just take them on components here, on components in these fixed coordinate system on X in which we start, so the fixed domain. So this is all these norms are not invariant, depend on the coordinate system, okay? Now anyways, having these, these uh, estimates, these bounds, um, we, we get a compactness theorem uh, directly, okay? So if you look at the sequence of connections, which satisfies this incoming bound. I'm sorry, I'm down here. So a sequence of connections which satisfies this uniform bound, okay, o on the curvature and the connection. Such a sequence of connections um, where you can always regularize it. And then in the new coordinate system, sorry, you get this type of bound, you get a uniform bound. And because of that, applying banaka leglu you then get a subsequence of these connections which converge uh, weakly in W1P and then as, as a corollary also strongly in LP, okay? So just from, from the fact that you get this uniform bound in, in the higher norm, 
is a higher norm, and you use Banach Aleglu, that helps you get this converging subsequence weekly in, in that norm, in that space W1P, and that is that is the whole result. So that's Uhmbeck compactness, because um, you just need an initial bound on the Riemann tense on the curvature, not the full connection derivative. Okay? We, we also need this bound here, this uniform bound. I'll say a bit more about that later on. But the main point here is you just need the curl part of the connection to be to be controlled, not the full connection derivatives. Okay? So that is uh, that's this Uhmbeck compactness we have. Um, there's a little little subtlety here. You, this connection here, you have to. I mean, you get for each connection, you get a different coordinate system. So you pull them all back to the initial coordinate system x. Uh, just transforming these as scalars, naively, not as connections. You just transform them as scalars to not lose regularity. Of course, this could mess with your uniform bounds, but because we have the uniform bound on the Jacobian, you maintain the uniform bound. And it's just something, little technicality of the proof. Okay? All right, so that's it. That's, that's all. That's our Uhmbeck compactness theorem. Uh, just a little uh, propaganda part here. So why, why do we think um, this is uh, important? So first of all, it should be feasible to apply because you only need to bounce the Riemann tensor, so an observable in the theory and so on, so you might know more about the Riemann tensor than about the full connection derivative. Okay, that's why we think this should be feasible to apply. Uh, so why is this useful? Well, we believe it's useful because, well, the gain of regularity going, I mean, this bound would give you weak LP convergence of a subsequence, but we get weak W1P convergence, so one more derivative of regularity of the convergence. And that's exactly, uh, what, I mean, it's actually more than you need, but, but this is enough to conclude that also um, products like these wedge products, products in the curvature, converge. So if you just know that this guy would converge um, weakly in LP, you couldn't conclude that the product converges weakly in LP to the product. I mean, that's, that's this, this issue with weak conversion, it's just a linear, a linear uh, tool. Okay, so that is a problem. If you have the weak W1P convergence, you get strong LP convergence as a special case. And then once you have strong convergence, you can, of course, take product. That's no problem anymore. Okay, you might lose a factor of p and so on, but, but that's not so much the issue. Okay, and with this in mind, I mean, just in case you're familiar with that, the stiff curl lemma so from hyperbolic conservation or semester of compensated compactness, that's quite important there, and that handles exactly these type of issues. Um, and, but there you just get a distributional convergence of these type of products. We get actually strong convergence of this with the theorem. And so we hope that, this, that we can get some improvements there. Uh, but we, we haven't really uh, worked on that yet. So this is just a hope at the moment. Uh, anyways, we, we put in one small application. So for the vacuum Einstein equation. So, so one way, uh, yes, yeah. Uh, no, 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 you, um, this, um, the, you, I mean, from the uniform bound here, you just get weak conversion in LP with Banakaleglu. And, and now, when uh, with, the improved, uh, with, the, with, the, with the improved bound we get, we get an improved regularity uh, weakly in W1P, and that implies strong convergence in LP. That's the idea of uh, how to apply it. So because of the, yeah, 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 yeah. How, yeah. So how to, how to use the result, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, yeah. Okay, okay, all right. Okay, so um, now for one application here, um, has the, uh, so, so for the vacuum Einstein equation, let's say, and just to illustrate that, we, we consider um, a, a, a sequence of, of metrics um, converging to some metric in W1P, so that would, something would get from a bound like this, roughly speaking. Let's say we have this, and we, we, um, we constructed it in a way that the Ricci tense of these guys converges to zero, okay? So we, we construct approximate solution of the vacuum Einstein equation. Let's say somewhere we got those. Now, um, just using this convergence, you have exactly the problem that you, uh, even though that thing converges to zero, when you compute the Ricci tensor of the limit metric, because you can't, we don't know whether you can pass the limit through products. You don't know whether this convergence holds. And, and so you can't conclude in general that the Ricci tensor of G is zero. So even though these guys, the, the Ricci tensor of these guys converges to zero, the limit metric might not be Ricci flat. That's exactly this little, this little subtlety of weak versus strong convergence. But now if you use um, that, you also get this type of bounds, if you assume that this curvature type bound and use this improved regularity of convergence, then you can conclude, okay, that, that thing will 
the limit metric will be richly flat because you can pass the limits to products. Okay? So that's an idea of how to apply that. All right. Um, I just, that's just on the side, so I'm, I'm still on the, uh, a little bit slow here. So I, I mentioned that we get more general results, so we can go from um, tangent bundles to vector bundles, okay? So uh, tangent bundles, um, so everything I mentioned so far, we, we work tangentially to a manifold, okay, connection manifold, we transform coordinates and so on and so on. But you can also go to vector bundles, and um, so that's, that's my view of a vector bundle. So a vector bundle is something where, where vectors can stick out of the manifold, okay? But that you have some additional structure on it, okay? So you still have all this here, that's still there. So, so just picture a, a shave, a shave a hedgehog, okay? And just, I mean, just picture it, okay? Uh, don't, don't do it. So just a shaved hedgehog, um, that would have a tangent plane, you have a base manifold, so shaved hedgehog itself, so on, so you have all the structure of an affine connection there. But then you also have these vectors sticking out, the non-tangential vectors, tangential vectors, on top of the hedgehog, okay? And um, for those, you, you have different type of structures, not coordinate transformations, you can use different transformation and use, or you just want to clarify how to change bases, okay? So you use for these uh, certain gauge groups which you just uh, prescribe in any way you like, okay? And it um, has physical meaning in young mills theory and so on. Um, and here we just consider, we focus on these groups, gauge groups, S, O, R, S. Um, so these R, S, that just refers to the signature of the metric in the orthogonality condition of the, of the Lie group, okay? So um, that makes a, I mean, if, these, uh, if, if the S is non-zero, then this is a non-compact group. If it's zero, then it's compact. Okay, so we look at these transformations. Okay, now the connection has some part, the affine part that sits on the tangent bundle, and then the part that handles all these vectors sticking out of it. Okay, I mean, this is just a very coarse picture here. But now um, on, on these geometries, we get again a similar result. That's the optimum regularity result as before, except that we can now smuggle in this connection coefficients that act on the on the um, fiber part that sticks out of the manifold, okay? We just put them that in here everywhere, and we have the same the same bound, same space as before. Instead of the curvature, I just put in the leading order part of the curvature for convenience, okay? We have the same type of bound. Okay, and then again, you can find a corner transformation that regularizes the gamma, the corner transformation, and the gauge transformation that regular, regularizes the A, the connection on the fiber. And then, um, well, in these new co the coordinates and gauges, you get, we get then optimal regularity. Together with these, uh, with these uniform estimates, okay? With these elliptic estimates. Okay, now again, if you look at the sequence of connections subject to this incoming bound with a fixed M, then you get, again, Uhenbeck compactness out of that. Okay, so that's an Uhenbeck compactness. Um, so you get, sorry, uh, as corollary of our optimal regular, uh, regularity result, you get, um, you get, yeah, again, that's this, uh, the sequence of such connections um, subject to this uniform bound. You can improve the bound and you get, again, weak convergence of a subsequence um, in W1P, okay, of the affine part of the connection and the, the connection on the fiber, okay? So that is, now that is, a, those are the, uh, the results in full generality, okay? So that's um, all we have. Um, now, just uh, again some propaganda part. So, first of all, this generalizes now uh, the optimal regularity theorem, generalizes the result from Kasten and Turk from Riemannian metrics to general affine connections, so co connection on tangent bundles and on vector bundles, at least with these certain gauge groups we consider. Okay. And it also uh, extends the result of Perrin Uhlenbeck um, from Riemannian to Lorentzian geometry, uh, well, actually, more, more general than this and from compact to non-compact gauge, gauge groups, okay? And let me just clarify that a little bit here. Um, so in, in Uhlenbeck's classical result, you, you fix a Riemannian metric on the base manifold, okay? And you have connections that sit, uh, that act on the fiber. You have a sequence of connections. So the connections on the fiber varies, but on the base manifold, everything is fixed and the affine part of the connection, okay? Uh, so that's fixed, um, and you assume optimum regularity at the start, but then you get, um, um, yeah, th then you get you get compactness of these connections. Okay, in our our result, in, in contrast, we we can allow for um, for varying connection on the base manifold that could come from a Lorentzian metric. So that's why extension to Lorentzian geometry. That's why I call it like this. But it could be more general what happens on the base manifold. Uh, and we start with a lower regularity L infinity. Okay, 
and we can use compact groups or non-compact groups as long as they are explicitly in this group. So we need a very specific group. In Uhlenbeck's case, in gen abstract compact groups work. Okay, so that's the difference. And then one one uh, bigger technical difference here is that we need this um, uniform estimate on L infinity. Okay, so that's this assumption. We have to put that in. Uh, Uhlenbeck doesn't need that in her theorem. She she assumes higher regularity to begin with, but without a bound. Okay, she really just needs a uniform bound on the curvature alone and you get invariant uh, norms in the Riemannian case. So that's the difference there. And so the way to apply these theorems, um, I mean, we, we guess the applications of our theorem will be very different than those of Uhlenbeck's theorem, so because, because of these differences. But then this is just a guess, so we don't really know about applications there. Okay, anyways, now um, the second half of my talk, it's I think uh, 10 minutes left, so not very good timing here. Let me just uh, really take a sip of water and then I really race through the rest here, so these equations. So first of all, um, how does this work? Uh, okay, so <clears throat> um, well, our proofs are all based on on this uh, elliptic equation. So the point is that um, you uh, you can um, map a connection to optimal regularity. So if and only if the Jacobian that brings you to this coordinate system. If and only if this Jacobian solves the so-called regularity transformation equation, okay, together with some other field. Okay, and that is this elliptic system I mentioned before. But there were some misunderstandings in the past. It could also be taken <laughs> like that. Yeah. But uh, we call it regularity transformation. So it should not appear too tacky. <laughs> so uh, maybe we are, but <laughs> um, anyways, those are the equations. So so if if this J, this Jacobian, Solve the equations here together with these unknowns. So gamma tilde comes from the connection of optimal regularity, but tensor transformed back to x coordinates. A is an auxiliary field. You need to introduce interability of the Jacobian. Um, if it solves the equation, um, if and only if it solves this equation in a certain regularity, then you can get to optimal regularity. Okay, so this is a determining condition of the equation. Okay, so um, let me uh, just. Um, Exactly, yeah. It's really just a coordinate Laplacian um, on Rn, really um, partial xi to partial, uh, partial x1 to partial xn. So that makes it all elliptic. I mean, all these guys are elliptic um, uh, operators. And delta is a co-derivative based on, on Euclidean metric in x coordinates. And that's actually the whole trick how you bring ellipticity into the picture. You base all these derivatives, I mean, the co-derivative, it's just a co-derivative. You base it on Euclidean metric, which you just introduce in the fixed coordinate system which you start. Okay, that's the whole trick. And why is this possible? Well, it's because connection transformation law. Yes, exactly. So that's the trick. That's how you, you base everything on that, and then you have elliptic operators. And why is this possible in the first place? So to, to, to show you this, let me show you how to derive the equations. So you start with the connection transformation law. Uh, the gamma tilde, that's just a connection of optimum regularity, tensor transformed to x coordinates. So that we just view that as a, the tensor transformation part of the connection. So you write the connection transformation on this, in this form. So that guy is now the optimal guy, uh, the optimal connection is the non-optimal one. Um, and now in this connection transformation law, there, there is no metric appearing. The connection could come from a metric, but it doesn't matter. The derivative operators don't use the metric. It's just the exterior derivative here. It doesn't see the metric. It's just the delta that sees the metric. So, well, we can just spend um, a new delta here. We can throw in a delta that's based on the Euclidean metric. And we do that, and that makes this guy elliptic, uh, just a standard Laplacian in Rn. And so now we, we, so, so we start differentiating. So we take the delta here when we bring some terms on the side. So we get this equation. Here we take the D of the connection transformation, which gives us this equation. And we continue, we, we modify that a little bit. We get another expression here, okay? And now these are, um, let's say these were solvable, these equations. Uh, there's a problem you see right away here. Um, J should be the Jacobian of a coordinate transformation. So for this, it must be integral to coordinates. Okay? So for all this to make sense, J must uh, have the vanishing curl condition here to be integral to coordinates. Second der derivatives of a coordinate transformation must commute, and therefore that guy curl must be zero. Okay? But this kind of Poisson-like equation determines all of J. So how can you pu put in this condition? Okay, now the trick is you, you interpret these guys as, as free parameters, as new unknowns in the equations. You just replace them by new unknowns. 
Okay? This can be a really bad idea. This is a really bad idea in general. You shouldn't do that. But here we had some insight. We, in an earlier paper, we introduced the equivalent Riemann flat condition. It's equivalent to uh, the transformation optimum regularity to exist. And this Riemann flat condition here on this gamma tilde, if you write it out, uh, the Riemann tensor looks pretty much like this. Uh, it only involves the d gamma tilde, not the delta gamma tilde. And because of that, you can do with the delta gamma tilde whatever you like. So we just say it's a free variable. It's a new unknown in the equation. So we throw it in. Uh, and now you can you just impose curl j equal to zero. You differentiate the, the equation, this one, through with a curl. Um, you differentiate it through, and that puts a curl on A that kills this term here, and out comes this equation. Okay, but we write in this as an exterior form, so we write the curl as the exterior derivative on a vector value to differential form. Just a little technicality. Um, now there's a problem. This guy here, you have two derivatives on the connection. Uh, the connection, I mean, that's, that has non-optimal regularity. That means you, in principle, you, you push these two derivatives down, the right-hand side, that messes up the regularity of A, that feeds into this equation, that pulls this down, one, one derivative, so your optimal connection, you, which you want to be optimal, is not optimal. You, you, you get where you start at. I mean, you don't gain anything there. That's a huge problem. You waste a lot of time. But it turns out this is not true. If you look at this term, term carefully here, uh, use a B sub Leibniz rule, you see this reorganizes in a way that here, this is the only derivative that sits on the gamma, but that's the D gamma. That term is controlled by the curvature. Okay? That's, uh, that's the only control we have, and that miraculously uh, turns up here. Okay? That's why we call it the uh, regularity miracle. Okay? Um, so now putting all that in, I mean, it's a little bit tacky here, but I mean, it's not like a miracle on the scale of water to wine, but still, we were very happy about it. Um, so anyways, putting that in, that thing is now controlled. You gain one derivative here. You gain one derivative. That means that is one derivative more regular. That feeds in regularity at the right level, so that thing can have optimum regularity. All good. We're pretty much done. Um, so we put all that together. Those are the IT equations. This, this little thing, the delta of A, that's the leftover uh, coordinate freedom we have in the equation, some sort of gauge freedom. Okay? Now the only task is you have to solve the equations, and of course, maybe... Uh, when you solve them, you don't get optimal regularity. But this works out. Let me just very quickly explain that in two minutes. So first of all, why does J, when you solve the equation, give you optimal regularity? Turns out, taking the curl of this equation, uh, pulling it inside the Jacobian, this right-hand side vanishes because of this equation. It's cooked up to do that. That means the curl of J is a solve the Laplace equation. Okay, that's implied by this equation and by this equation. Solve the Laplace equation, then putting in this data that the curl vanishes on the, on the boundary data, that means that uh, it must be zero everywhere, okay? So that's the trick. That's how you get integrability of J. Now, why do you get optimal regularity? Here's a funny thing happening. Um, in the derivation, it happens that you go to a larger solution space. So gamma tilde, when you solve that, has, doesn't play the role of a connection of optimal regularity anymore. It, it, it's meaningless, actually. So what you do is you forget about gamma tilde here, you forget about it, you introduce a new gamma tilde, prime, just in a way what it should be. If J is really the transformation to optimal regularity, gamma tilde should be that guy, gamma tilde prime, actually. And now you just check, is this really um, getting, uh, giving me better regularity? So you take the Laplacian of this thing, you take the Laplacian, you use the J solves the, uh, this J equation here, you get some cancellations, and out pops again the first RT equation, this RT equation, but with a new field A, so-called so gauge transform field. And now you can check the regularity with elliptic theory and so on, and you see in the end, yes, that guy gains one derivative, has optimal regularity, and so also the connection, which you derive with just a tensor transform of this guy, has optimal regularity. Okay, that's how this works in a nutshell. Okay, now, uh, very last step. Uh, how do you solve the equation? There's one obstacle. Uh, first equation has this gradient product. So that means in each step for LP gradients, you lose LP regularity, you always cut it by half. If you do that iteration scheme infinitely many times, you have nothing left, okay? Um, turns out you can separate off the first equation using this, this gauge transformation business, which I mentioned earlier. Um, it turns out you can um, use this gauge freedom in this vector field here on the right-hand side um, by, yeah, to, to separate off the equation. How does it work? You introduce this as a new parameter B, uh, as a new unknown B, smuggle it into the equation, you make these transformations, and then you see you can write the lower equation in this way. Okay, that's what we call the reduced T equation. Why does it help? Well, if this is really a free parameter down here, then you can just view it like this. Just set it equal to zero and forget about these dependencies on gamma tilde. And that, that means this equation really decouples. Okay? Of course, this could be wrong, 
but one can actually show it's not wrong. It's, it really works out. You can solve the equation. I mean, this, this is linear now. This is easier to solve. And then you can check that um, that's the J you produce in this way really is the same trick from before. Gives you transformation to optimum regularity, to connection of optimum regularity. Okay, so I'm skipping a lot of steps, but this works out again with a similar idea. So you get again the first such equation back. That gives you regularity boost and so on and so on, and that gives you optimum regularity. Okay, so I'm sorry, I'm, uh, I'm over time already. Okay, so uh, yeah, then very last slide here. Uh, yeah, so thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>